Thank you to everyone who participated in the breakout sessions. And I welcome you back. Um, we have the closing keynote now. And this will be delivered by Mr. Richard Dalton. And Richard Dalton is the director of the Royal African Society. And he was formerly the Africa editor for the Economist newspaper. He has also worked with the Times and the Independent. Richard became director of the Royal African Society in 2002, following a long career as a journalist with a focus on Africa. His first two years on the continent as a volunteer teacher in Uganda coincided with the first two years of Idi Amin's rule. He visited almost every country in sub-Saharan Africa in addition to writing extensively about Africa, he made three full-length documentaries on Africa for Channel 4 and for the BBC, and also several short films. Richard Dowden is the author of Africa, Altered States, Ordinary Miracles. I'd like to welcome now to the stage, Mr. Richard Dowden. Please give us a <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for that, that introduction. Um, yeah, the, the, this is the last session, and I was tasked with trying to sum up the whole day, but I moved from session to session, and I learned a lot. But I thought trying to make a coherent sense out of a whole day, I thought, no, there are lots of gems in there, but to make a coherent narrative out of it, at this stage, I thought was probably a bit difficult. But I'd like to reflect on it, I think today reinforce one very strong feeling that I've had for a long time. This is an incredibly exciting time for Africa. There are all sorts of major decisions coming up which could take it in different directions. But the problem is that, of course, that Africa, to which you can fit in Europe, America, and China, and still have lots of space, that's how big it is, and we often forget that, because on the old maps that we're all used to, Africa is about half the size it actually is uh, on the planet. Um, so any generalization you try to make, the words just crumble in your hands. But a couple of things we do know, which I think, I, I always think are incredibly important. There are more than 2,000 languages in Africa. 2,000 languages. And before the Europeans took it over, there were between six and 10,000 political units. So societies that ruled themselves, uh, they were obviously all changing and moving around and accumulating new area. The area I lived in, in, in Buganda, it was an, it was an empire. It was, the Buganda extended into other areas, absorbed the people uh, and made it their, their empire. So it was changing all the time. But suddenly, these outsiders come in, and they sit down, and they, they, uh, they try and map it out. And they draw lines on it. And they're sitting in London and Brussels and Paris, saying, we want that bit. No, we don't know what, well, what's there. Nobody knows what's there. And they draw the lines on the maps, sometimes absolutely straight lines. The most insane one, of course, is the Capri Strip. Uh, Livingston had written in one of his books that he could, you could walk up the Zambezi, uh, it, had, it was absolutely fine, but he did have to take a diversion, and he didn't notice that there were rapids there. But the Germans thought that they wanted access to the Indian Ocean, and so they, out of Namibia, southwest Africa, they drew that line, the Caprivi Strip, to the Zambezi, thinking they could, wouldn't have to stop at Cape Town, uh, could go straight across the continent into the Indian Ocean. Uh, you can't, because Zambezi has rapids on it. But the map has not changed. And I, I, I think that's probably the, the, the greatest catastrophe that Africa's had, is the way it was just carved up and left with these, uh, let's call them 10,000 societies, suddenly wedged into these, uh, into, into these what are now nation states. And I, that underlies all the political problems, I think, that Africa, Africa has. I think the, the other one 
is just the loss of capital. I mean, we're talking about $60 billion a year, for, according to Carlos Lopez this morning, in illicit, uh, illicit financial flows. I always thought illicit meant sort of secretive. It doesn't. It means illegal. And as, as President Obama says, and uh, we heard today, Obama said, no, the problem is it's legal. And we heard about Switzerland and all the other uh, havens, and of course, the big one, our own, and it's called the City of London. Uh, it's not, you know, the Queen has to ask permission to go in there. It's a state within a state. Um, so thank God for whoever hacked into uh, Mossack Fonseca. Um, somebody's whispering to me that it was, a wisp it was an inside job. Uh, I guess we'll know much, much, much more soon over the next few weeks. I think it's going to leak out more and more stuff. And I think it's, I think it's going to probably show the UK in a pretty bad light. Um, Switzerland we've already, uh, has already been dis debated. Where this will lead, I'm not sure. But I, it's fascinating that just as before this broke, um, the Prime Minister called a conference on corruption and money laundering. Had somebody tipped him off, do you think? I don't, it's, a, it's a major conference. Um, and uh, I just wonder, the timing seems very odd. And I wonder if he got a tip off that this was coming. Um, so that loss of capital is combined also with a lack of value adding in Africa. Uh, it's only 11 uh, percent of GDP, uh, half that of, of, Asia, of Asia. So Africa is just not adding, uh, doing manufacturing and adding uh, value to its, its uh, raw materials. And as Carlos Lopez says, yes, it's difficult to do that, but if you're smart, you, you can do it. And that's what Asia did, and it's now Africa's turn to take on, the, to become the manufacturer of the, of the world. Um, it's, it's big bonus, I think. Everybody gasps when you talk about this, but it, I think it's big bo bonus is its rising population. A billion now, two billion, two, more than two billion uh, by 2050. Uh, but there is a widening <coughs> gap between rich and poor there. So unless the leaders get it right, you will see a huge uh, lumpen, um, peri-urban um, shanty towns of people <coughs> desperate to come to the town to get a job uh, and a, a, uh, a, a, a rural area, rural areas just left and uh, not really developed and that would be the tragedy that the towns can't feed themselves, the, or the, the rural areas can't feed the towns, there aren't enough jobs in the towns to buy the food. That's the sort of night, but I don't think that will happen. I think with the rising population, increased uh, education levels uh, and connectivity, I think that probably won't happen. And this thing, I, I just, I mean, the connectivity thing in Africa still blows my, blow, absolutely blows my mind. I, I, 1971, wandering around a distant part of, of um, Tanzania, I, arrived in a village and people came up and rubbed my skin to see if the white would come off. They'd never seen a white man before. And that's in my lifetime. And that, I mean, now, you know, you go to the same village and you could probably get TV and you could, um, you know, you'd be able to make phone calls from there. It's just, I mean, that sort of change in that, in that space of time in human history, I think, is just absolutely extraordinary. And I'm you know, I wish I could live on to see what happens next. I'm probably getting towards the end of my career, but I just think it's going to be, it's going to get more and more interesting. Uh, now people know what's going on. They're connected. We've heard a lot about that today, uh, the way uh, with so, through social media and other ways. People know what's going on. They can discuss it, debate it, make decisions for themselves. Um, and in the areas where they're, there aren't, there isn't connectivity. Um, I'm part of a project to, with Inmarsat, which is the British satellite. It's a spy satellite and it does shipping, but it also has space to do other stuff. 
So uh, there's a project to ensure that all those parts of Africa, it will be sitting somewhere over Congo, this satellite. It's a stationary one, and it's massive, and it's got to last for a long time. Um, so to use that um, for education and health, so you, from the satellite, you can get free downloads at schools and hospitals in areas where mobile phone companies are not going to go. Uh, and I think this is going to be quite an exciting project because then in rural areas, well, I can't wouldn't say you'll be able to sit and watch TV, but teachers will be able to download plans, uh, talk to each other on the internet, and hospitals the same in those areas where there's no mobile connectivity yet. Uh, and, but the, the, the downside of, of all that connectivity, of course, it's very threatening for governments. And Mr. Museveni, I noticed, closed down the entire system during the election. Um, and uh, it just shows what a threat it is to, to those sort of governments that uh, want to stay in total control. I think also there's a problem in that there's a lack of continent-wide leadership. At one time, we had President Mbeki in South Africa following on from the great man, Mandela. Obazanjo in Nigeria, whatever you think of him, he made stuff happen. And Mele Zanawi, the radical, very independent thinker in Ethiopia. And with those three leaders together, you really felt there, was a, there were, there were continent-wide leaders, love them or hate them, but they could make stuff happen. And that seems to have gone. Where are their successors now? Um, in, and this is really important because, you know, as, as Bill Clinton said, it's the, it's the economy, stupid, uh, in, in answer. No, in Africa, it's the politics, stupid. And getting that leadership right and getting the politics right is absolutely essential. You track the civil wars in, in Africa, and they all come down to, at some stage, to bad decisions by, by leaders. Um, so, and, and it's a, it is a bad time for those countries now. With Nigeria, uh, it has a brilliant cabinet. Many of them probably sat in this, this room. Um, and they've, you know, they're well educated, they're well qualified for the job, but Nigeria has no money. Uh, because of the oil price has crashed and the rest, you know, a lot of it's gone, um, gone missing. Uh, South Africa is flatlining and we're waiting for someone to take it to the next stage. And that may be still quite a long wait. Uh, so the two great, the two big countries um, seem to be, um, flat, and of course, the one nobody talks about. You very rarely had here discussed in London. I, I'm maybe, it may be just me, but I, I don't hear the name, the Democratic Republic of Congo, except in a rather dismissive way. But this, you know, this is the great, rich heart of Africa. If you, could, if you could harness the Congo River, you could light up the whole of Africa overnight. It just, it's, I mean, the power of that river and the, 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 the climate, the richness of its soils, the, uh, and they have a well-educated population and no leadership. And it's, it lies there waiting, just waiting. And of course, down in the, in the southeast, in Katanga, one of the rich, the not one of, no, the richest known mineral deposit on the planet. Working at about a quarter of what it could do. So there's Congo waiting to come back from its sleep as well. So it just needs, and it just needs good leadership. Um, where is there good leadership? It's nice that Tanzania has produced a president who gets into the office early and um, kicks ass. <laughs> um, fires people who aren't sitting at their desk. Um, I think uh, whether he, but it, I don't think Tanzania, in that sense, is a continent-wide leader. But it's inspiring that at least there's someone around doing that sort of thing. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with that thought. But with a, with a, just the right leaders making the right decisions at this time, I think could really transform the continent. <laughs> And I think a lot of those leaders will, might come from this room, some of them, or they might, you might find yourselves 
advising them, working with them, and I just hope that what, you've, what you can see as an outsider looking into Africa, you can take back and see what really needs to happen, because it's all there. Africa's waiting for its future, and its future, I'm absolutely convinced, is that it's going to be the leader of the planet in so many areas, in so many areas, that all it needs is that breakthrough that of, of leadership, of clarity of thought, the ability to, all that, those languages, all those little societies, pull them together, unify them, get them working together, and Africa will happen. Thank you. Thank you.